First of all, stand here with enormous respect for this institution called LNT. I have driven past this building so many times in admiration of the structural engineering on which it stands. I was just sharing with them. I had tried to enter this building 20 years ago and I used to have my own software consultancy to see if I can get a breakthrough in LNT. I couldn't. So I have admired this building from outside For over two decades, today happened to be the day that I came inside. In fact, my admiration for LNT is so much, I should tell you what I have carried in my heart for over a decade, and everybody in my organization of infinitism know this. And I should share with you something that happened this morning. I'll go from this morning. Morning I woke up and my son was asking me, he's 16 years old, Papa, can we go out for dinner somewhere tonight? I told him, no, I have a program. Where? LNT. Papa, the corporate program la panamati, Papa. I said, I have also surprised myself by saying, I will go. Yeah? Then he asked me, what is LNT? So my simple explanation to a way a 16 year old could understand was, wherever you see a building and wonder how this was constructed, probably it was done by LNT. That's what I told my son. <laughs> If it was across the river, across the ocean, if it was probably a road that was laid in six months' time when the government expected it will take two years, it was probably done by LNT. And I think I should share with you what my entire organization at Infinitism know this. I've always told them. I didn't know this evening will come and I'm not sharing this for any other reason. I never thought this evening will come. But you should know that something that has been discussed in my organization always. We always told them that infinitism should grow so big that one day we should build an infrastructure so big and that must be built by LNT. And, and I know it will happen because there is this great desire to build the world's best school. My heart always pains to see the entire world came to Nalanda to study and today from here we go all over the world to study. And I think it should be possible to revolutionize education to the point it should be possible for us to build the world's best school and get children from all the countries to come and study in this place one day. I also believe with so much development of human intelligence, the young mind is always craving for an explanation, explain 
God scientifically, explain religion scientifically, explain spirituality scientifically, explain life sp scientifically. And I really think there must be a spiritual address in the world where people do not converge for sentimental reasons, but you are able to get the entire world to converge, to understand the science of life, the science of spirituality, the science of faith, the science of God. And I really believe that a time will come when we will grow so big and we will build a spiritual address in India to which the entire world will converge. I don't know which one will come first, whether it will be the world's best school or it will be a spiritual address to which the entire world will converge. But internally the desire for us in the organization over 10 years is whenever that happens, we would negotiate with LNT and get it done. Okay. And that's a promise. So you have a prospective prospect talking to you. I also stand here with great respect for whoever you are. I have not come here to deliver a speech from a platform of holier than thou, that I know it all, let me tell you what is life and what is work. Because I really believe each one of you is a living encyclopedia in your own rights. I really tell people the best lessons on life is not learned from books. It is learned by studying a fellow human being. The more and more you can observe, probably an office boy in this premises who has not taken off in an entire year and you learn sincerity of work from him which Harvard's cannot teach you probably learn punctuality, discipline, commitment from somebody here, maybe a clerical staff, maybe a gate watchman, maybe an executive director who has walked into this premises every day on time and is not known to be late ever so I really believe the greatest lessons of life do not come from library, it doesn't come from internet, it doesn't come from googling. It comes by keeping our eyes and ears open and looking around for fellow colleagues, leaders within the organization, members in our own team, who probably on a daily basis is inspiring you with their own work ethics, their own unique leadership styles, their own objectivity with which they approach a situation. So in that sense, I really know if I was not a speaker today, and if I had to only sit one-on-one -on -one with each one of you, I'm sure there isn't an exception here who will not teach me something about life. So I'm not standing here one bit thinking of myself as a Mahatreya or a Ra, and trying to give you a holier than thou speech and I'll be the last person to do it. So I'm standing here with enormous respect to the human potential that must be there in front of me. But then we all need reminders to remember. Sometimes we can get so locked into the monotony of day-to-day -day work, habitually catching up with deadlines so sometimes even our strengths get buried deep inside. Sometimes what we know do not find expressions. So this is just a humble attempt to just go into the memory lane of some of my own experiences, which probably is not even new to you. It may just be a validation as I speak. You might nod your head. And this is something I hold very sacred about all the speeches. People who actually need the speech don't listen to speeches properly. People who don't need the speech, who are already living by what is being told, they sit there and say, right, I also believe in it. So it is ironical that sometimes the speech that people who need the most probably miss it. Hoping that that feeling, thy presence that we began this with, will keep the seeker within all of you alive. And somehow make me sensitive 
to you. Let us see whatever unfolds. Because my first lesson on work, on work ethics, on growth came from a fellow human being. I was not a bright student. Probably if I had applied, I wouldn't have got a job in LNT ever. I was not a bright student. And somehow I realized through my academic performance, I'm not going to go too far in life. So I decided to take the other way, to pick up a job as early as possible. So I found my first job when I was only 18 and a half. I was still in the final year of my graduation. And it was to teach computer programming. I'd barely completed a course for six months and they gave me a job. Those days it used to be like this. If you study in this batch, you can teach the next batch. And here I was on the job. My first job was in Pune. It's not going to be too much about my life. I just want to give you a beginning to it. And somewhere when I went for the job, and I saw Pune was a place with some absolute pretty women, young girls, and you were going to be teaching computer programming for them, and you should listen to my entire speech, remembering I was 18 and a half. Why is the color? You know, expressions of growing years. And here was this girl by name Minon Pinto, an Anglo-Indian girl, and somehow there was a tremendous pull towards her. Those days we never used to have these individual chairs. It used to be benches in a computer training institute. So I managed to go and sit in one of those benches next to Minon Pinto. Chumma! And asked her any doubts you can ask me, I'll clarify. She had no doubts, but I was insistent. You can ask, it's okay, I'm there to help you. Don't see me as a teacher. I've had this great privilege right through my life. Every time I commit a mistake, he'll catch me the first instance. He never gave me an opportunity for my mistakes to become habits. The moment I commit a mistake, somebody will catch me. And I as I was sitting next to Minan Pinto, making advances, right at the door of the training room with his hands like this, my branch manager Peter Christian was standing. And he said, can I see you in my room? In the 10-15 seconds that it took from there to go to the room, in my mind I had prepared all my defenses, including telling him, your mind is narrow-minded, so you thought I was wrong, I was only a good teacher, I had no such... In all my defenses were ready. The moment I entered his room, he sat, I was still standing, he didn't ask me to sit. He looked straight into my eye and he said, I know you are only 18 and a half and I do not have a right to tell you what you should do and what you should not do. I have no right. But I have the right to tell you something. A teacher should have character. And if you cannot have character, you should not be a teacher. That's a decision you have to make. If you want to be an 18 and a half year old, resign from being a teacher and live your life the way you want to live your life, flirt around. But if you choose to be a teacher, I think there are certain character expectations to a teacher and I think you have to live your character at all times. He stunned his voice and said, you have to subordinate your likes and dislikes to the purpose of your life. I repeat, I think my entire life began on that one moment. For me, that was a moment when Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi was thrown in the railway platform and he realized what he was capable of. At 18 and a half, he drove this message straight into my head. You have to subordinate your likes and dislikes to the purpose of your life. Alternatively, you have to subordinate the purpose of life to your likes and dislikes. If all you want is that you want to flirt around, then you cannot be a teacher. And if you want to be a teacher, then you have to give up your likes and dislikes for the sake of being a teacher. 
And as if even before I could digest that first message, he delivered the second. He said, you can either be a typical 19 year old or you can be a 19 year old where all the other 19 year olds look up to you. Do you just want to be another 19 year old, another 19 year old lost in the crowd? Every 19 year old will bunk classes, every 19 year old will go for movies, every 19 year old will be interested in the opposite sex and that is what you want to be? Or do you want to be a 19 year old where all the other 19 year olds will look up to you? You make a decision, you can go. He had nothing to, he didn't want my answers in, I couldn't sleep that night. I know these lessons came too early for me in life. I'm still discovering the depth of these two messages. Even today, even today in the morning when the wake up call rings and my body begs to sleep, I can still remember Peter Christian telling me, you have to subordinate your likes and dislikes to the purpose of your life. If you want to be healthy, if you want to be fit, if you do not want to be a nuisance in the ICU, where your family has, I have sat outside an ICU. I know what it is to sit outside an ICU with your mother inside. And I know if I don't take care of my health, you can be lost in your work. You can live your entire life building your department, executing projects, being a value add to LNT. You can do everything and one day you will retire. And at that time when you retire, if all you look back and you realize all the success that you have produced for LNT, all those awards that you have got in LNT, all those recognitions you have got in LNT, all the promotions you have had in LNT, but all this has cost you your health. When Standard Motors was closed, the chairman of Standard Motors said, I gave up all my health in order to earn this wealth only to today realize all my wealth will not give me back my health if you're going to be taking care of everything except yourself a time will come in your life when your body will ring the bell and you cannot reverse it you just cannot reverse it so if part of all this thing called work Karma Yogi, involvement in work, you wake up thinking about your projects, you walk in thinking about your projects, you're sitting there in the car thinking about you, you go mind thinking about your projects, and in the process you have never taken care of yourself. I'm sure some of you already have your diabetes. I'm sure some of you already have your BP. I'm sure some of you are already panting for a breath. Probably you're just climbing up this entire inclined plane to come here, and maybe you're panting for breath. And body is somehow telling you, care for me. And we can keep on ignoring it. Because body will never give you this instant gratification. You will not exercise today and feel healthy tomorrow. It's not like a project which you can do for three years and get a special award. It will never pamper your ego. Work will pamper your ego. Health will not pamper your ego. With lot of respect for what this organization is to all of you. With a lot of respect. I just heard a respected advisor would be here for 47 long years serving the whole thing and be here for another three months with enormous respect for all the value he would have added to this place. But for him, a lot of things here would have never happened. But the fact is, few years from now, LNT will replace him. He cannot be replaced in his family. There is no replacement to you in your family. Your organization will get somebody to the chair in which you are sitting a couple of days after you leave. But to that wife, to those children, to those grandchildren, there is no replacement. And hence, it is an awesome responsibility for you, even for you to be at your best at work, by 4 o'clock if the back pains. How will we produce efficiency at work? If you cannot get a good night's sleep, because the metabolism of the body is not right, 
How will you come back in the morning and produce that efficiency? If man cannot begin the day with an efficiency and sustain that efficiency till the end of the day, and it is not possible unless this body is cared for. So take this as just one amongst you requesting you. As much as it is important that we are a great blessing to the organization that we represent, we should not be a nuisance to the family. If one of us is sick, you know what all the colleagues will do? Use panna mudi, adam moon, saathu kudi, kundu kudur poanga. One Harlix bottle will come, one flower bouquet will come, and you have to take it like this and keep it like that. Allada panna mudi. What no ne tik potro ani thana. And they will all come give you a get well card and go. There is something called family. And they will be lying down in that caretaker bench. They will be the one who will sitting outside in ICU not knowing when your number will be called. And we owe it to the family to take care of the health. Now it is such a simple message. I will subordinate my likes and dislikes to the purpose of my life. And in the morning when the wake up call rings and body being body, it negotiates with me saying that why don't you sleep for 15 more minutes? And I tell myself, even though you like sleeping and you dislike exercising, if the purpose of your life is to live and die healthy, you got to exercise, subordinate your likes and dislikes to the purpose of your life. So I force my body out of the bed and get into the exercise that I am not willingly doing but I know it will do good to me because I want the purpose of being a healthy person and not a nuisance to the family I will subordinate my likes and dislikes to the purpose of my life there is a beautiful opportunity presenting itself in the organization it is very clear if I can put my hand up and say I want to assume that additional responsibility Additional responsibility, additional cross to carry, additional demand on your emotion and intelligence, additional demand probably on your working hours. But chances are assuming that one responsibility is going to fast forward your career within the organization by a couple of years. A part of us will always negotiate. Why do you want to carry additional burden? Subordinate your likes and dislikes to the purpose of your life. We will work in this organization for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. A colleague who joined along with you also will work for the same tenure of 30 years. And between two people who have worked the same tenure of 30 years, one person is going to accomplish lot more in the same tenure of 30 years than the other and the one who was able to fast forward the results. And who is that? The one who was willing to subordinate his likes and dislikes to the purpose of his life. Alternatively, you allow to subordinate the purpose of your life to your likes and dislikes. If every morning in my work, all I am looking at is what I like and what I don't like, what I want to do and what I do not want to do, rather than thinking what is the right thing to do, we teach this to children in the age bracket of 14 to 17. The first thing that is taught to children in the age bracket of 14 to 17 in the path of infinitism is this never ask what is easy ask what is right because continuously building a life asking this question what is easy will give you a lot of easy todays but it will not give you a great tomorrow it is only when you begin to ask this question what is right then you, are, you may be having tough todays but all these tough todays are going to work together and construct a great tomorrow so the first lesson for me on life, on work, the philosophy of life that I learned from Peter Christian was I'll subordinate my likes and dislikes to the purpose of my life. The alternative being subordinating the purpose of life to my likes and dislikes and to a very important question to answer. Do you want to be a typical 19 year old or a 19 year old where all the other 19 year olds will look up to? I think a question at every stage we need to ask this question. And this gives an enormous impetus for us to be a living role model to others. Why am I sharing these two things? I realized these two gave me the work ethic that was able to accelerate 
the growth of my career path, making up for me not having a great past. Till 18 and a half, I didn't have a past that was worth even referring to. And yet these two work ethics accelerated the entire process. Just one more example from my life and then only at the end I'll come back to my life. From there I went to a company called Usha Computers. I worked for a manager called David Samson. David Samson was today what I understand as a leader who epitomized let problems come from anywhere, solutions will come from me. That's what leadership is all about. Anybody can tell you what the problem is. Leadership is in saying, this is the solution. In fact, when somebody opens the door and walks into your cabin, he should get this feeling, doesn't matter with what issue I go in, I leave the place with a solution. That's leadership to an organization. It's not authority, it's not designation, it's not cabins, it's not table, but it is being a solution provider to any situation. So to me, a classic definition of a leader will be, let problems come from anywhere. Solutions will come from me. To think solutions, to make it habitual, what's the solution? Because sometimes we exaggerate the problem. We understand the problem within 2-3 minutes. And yet to make it look really good problem. We add so much details and so much emotions to the whole thing. A good leader says, the moment I have understood what's the problem, can we together think what the solution can be? And at that age, David Samson was a huge inspiration who epitomized, let problems come from anywhere, let solutions come from me. How he used to do that is, all his meetings will start with this magic phrase. He would always start the meeting saying this, there is a solution. That's his first sentence. Even before he hears what you have come there for, what the meeting is about, his first sentence will always be, there is a solution. And there is a way, and the way is on the way. Tell me, what you have come to discuss. And sometimes when the problem is presented to him, or an issue is presented to him, a crisis is presented to him, even if he doesn't have an answer, he will again auto-suggest, there is a way, and the way is on the way. And it used to be his massive explanation. Just because today we are not able to think of a solution, it does not mean tomorrow also we won't be able to think of a solution. With today's maturity and today's data and today's intelligence, we are not getting the trigger. Chances are a fresh sunrise tomorrow, with some additional data, with a freshness of intelligence, we might come up with a solution. Maybe adding two more people to the brainstorming, from somewhere a trigger will come, but he used to keep on repeating, there is a solution, there is a way, and the way is on the way. Somehow I realized, working with David Thompson through the entire period, leadership is about direction of intelligence, not about intelligence. I have seen gold rank, gold medalist, all India rank holders, the best of the best people coming from IIMs and IITs, and sometimes there is no dearth of intelligence, but direction of intelligence becomes an issue. Because if your intelligence is always about complaining, it's always negative, it's always about what is wrong, it's always defining the problems, it's always counting the troubles, it doesn't take us anywhere. It is not the size of your intelligence, but it is the direction of intelligence with which people have achieved and accomplished whatever they have accomplished. One of the recent classic examples is Nano. When Ratan Tata was going in his car and he noticed in those torrential rains a middle class family in a kinetic Honda with four people, the parents and the two children, and somehow Ratan Tata could not take it. So he realized with the windshield itself, if the visibility is so bad for the driver, what it should be for the family to drive a two-wheeler with four people there, and that too, the, how risky it is, can something be done about it? So in the subsequent board meeting, this proposal was presented, can we come up with a car that can be built for a lack of rupees? 
people were very clear in explaining how it cannot be done. Very, very clear. Every point was so beautifully explained. And the meeting ended convincing Ratan Tata that it cannot be done. What is important is how the meeting ended, not what happened in the meeting. At the end of the meeting, Ratan Tata concluded the meeting by saying, now that we have used our intelligence and explained how it cannot be done, can we use our intelligence believing it can be done and start thinking what can be done? So I just request all of you to believe it can be done, think for some time and come back. And that was the beginning of the possibilities of a car for a lakh of rupees. Now this is one thing that's going to scale you in your career, especially in an establishment like this, where we are committed to creating spaces, creating infrastructure, and every day there is a war between resources and reality. People who are going to stand out and people who are going to be an accelerant in the path of the organization are basically going to be those where independent of all your education and experience and expertise that you bring in your past, what is going to be the direction of your intelligence in the future? Till 1955, nobody in the history of the planet has ever run a mile in less than four minutes. 1956, for the first time, a man by name Roger Bannister ran the mile in less than four minutes. There are two things which are very important out of this incident. One, the direction of his intelligence. Because anybody who attempted to run a mile in less than four minutes suffered tremendous cardiac problems and they crumbled to it. For the first time, a man came and he realized in order to run a mile in less than four minutes, everybody has been training their legs. Strengthening their calf, strengthening their knee strength, strengthening their toe power. Everybody has been thinking, by getting my legs fit enough for it, I will be able to run. But the actual impediment has never been the leg. It has been the heart. The heart was not able to pump to the demands that were required to send in the amount of blood that was required to the legs. In just defining the problem by directing his intelligence, he said, let me train the heart. In fact, the focus was no more on the legs. His entire structure of training was on how to ensure his heart's pumping capacity is improved. Just because somebody got the direction of his intelligence right, 1956, he was able to run a mile in less than four minutes. What is important is, the second factor out of this incident the very next year, 304 people ran a mile in less than four minutes. In the history of humanity, it did not happen. But the moment one man showed a direction to human intelligence and solved what seemed irresolvable, 304. And today, most athletes can run a mile in less than four minutes. Leadership is not about qualification and experience and a lot of other things. Leadership is all about let problems come from anywhere. Solutions will come from me. If somebody walks into my cabin, when he goes back, either he'll go with a solution or he'll go with his confidence, I'll give him a solution. He will not come with one problem and go back with three problems. Or he should not enter the cabin of a leader believing I'm going to meet a problem. There is a way and the way is on the way. The moment you set your mind into this direction, there is a solution. From there everything begins. Just these three principles, which I was blessed enough to inherit before I was 20. I'll subordinate my likes and dislikes to the purpose of my life. Even today at 47, I still ask this question. Am I another 47 year old or am I a 47 year old living a life where other 47 year olds can look up to? I still keep asking myself this question. 
Are you a benchmark? Are you a living role model? I still keep challenging myself. And three, let problems come from anywhere. Solutions will come from me. There is a way and the way is on the way. And on the premises of this, everything began to come. Everything began to get magnetized. I'm just here to share that an elaborate research was done. I'm just deviating from my life to research. And they sampled 500 most successful people in the world from industrialists, Henry Ford and Rockefellers, to artists like Picasso, Leonardo da Vinci, to social reformers like Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, to religious reformers like Jesus Christ, Prophet Muhammad, to sports personalities like Pele. They created a sample of 500 people from all walks of life that they considered the most successful and did an extensive research to find out though the fact is that each one of them will have their own individual geniuses is there anything common to all the people who made it to the top ironically they discovered there were seven qualities that was common to all these 500 no matter what their field of expression was that they made it to the top Now it has helped me tremendously at every stage to monitor myself against these seven qualities and see where am I lacking, where I need to develop. Because it is a fact that for us to succeed we have to be good at many things. For us to fail, one thing will be enough to pull us down. Just one thing will be enough to pull us down. It's not difficult to explain to a set of people sitting here, the weakest part of the building will make the entire building weak. And yet for the building to be strong, the structure to be strong, everything has to be right. So consistent monitoring of each one of you on self-introspection. Forget the HR appraisals and how the organization wants to evaluate your performance. Individually, if every man can consistently keep introspecting himself on these seven attributes, we are at least making the right beginning because we know that we are building a career, building a future on the premises of those seven qualities which has been common to the 500 most successful people in the world. It also helps us to exercise this leadership to our team because one of the most important things is to create the legacy. You will keep moving from one chair to another chair and one of your greatest responsibilities is not only in scaling to the higher chair but to ensure good people are groomed to the chair in which you were. In fact, two things are going to be the greatest challenge for any organization to turn around and hit the top. One is infrastructure and two is leadership availability. Fortunately, in a case like LNT, infrastructure may not turn out to be a limitation for what LNT for individuals and as an organization can ever be. The second challenge is going to be the greatest challenge, leadership availability. It's not about the number of vacancies we have in an organization at the bottom. It's the number of unfilled positions that we hold in an organization at the top. It's not about somebody being forced into the chair, it is about somebody being good enough for the chair. In fact, that is why world over today, leadership training is becoming an integral part of corporate development. I'm not talking about speakers like me coming and speaking. This 90 minutes can entertain you a lot, can give you some insights, can open your eyes in certain direction. But a complete transformation of an individual happens through sustained training. It has to be continuous. You have to work on the inside of a man and get the man right. And today it's such an integral part of all the corporate continuous leadership development for leadership availability. 
And what are we talking about the seven qualities for leadership availability? So let us not only self-introspect and find out of these seven traits, where all we can give a tick mark, great. Where all we need to continue to work upon and also evaluate each one of you in your respective second lines and third lines. What are some of these attributes they have and where they need to be groomed so that we continuously keep creating this leadership availability. And the first quality of the seven they found in all of them was passion for excellence. I really don't know whether this can be trained outside in. It has to come inside out. Passion for excellence. They did not want to be lost in a crowd. No matter what they did. Swami Chinmayananda used to fold a paper before throwing it into the dustbin. And people used to ask him, how does it make a difference? Any of throwing it into the dustbin? And he used to say, why not add beauty even to waste paper? That touch of excellence. How a sculptor was sculpting those strands of hair for a statue that he was creating which was 30 feet high. And how the king from the base asked that sculptor, for me the build, this sculpture looks already magnificent. Why are you still giving it the finishing touches? He said, no, I'm just getting the stand of the hair right. And the king called out in return saying that at 30 feet height, any of nobody will know. And the sculptor said, but I will know I compromise and I don't want to compromise. If I do something, let it happen without a compromise. I should give myself a pat on the back before I come down. Passion for excellence. In whatever you do, in the way you sign, in the way you underline, in the way you present, in the way you have a signature for your email, in the type of envelope you use. In fact, the rest of the organization should know in the way it is, the name is written on the envelope, it is from you. In the way, don't compromise. I know we are an SMS generation, everything is G8, everything is LV, LOL, in fact, spelling, everything goes for a toss. But I really think when you send me an email, reading that email should be a pleasurable experience. It should not be as if I am a sub-editor who has to proofread the entire email to understand exactly what have you written. There, I still think no matter how much we have taken to technology, those old typewriting practices of sentences starting with a capital letter, space after a full stop, comma where comma has to be there, paragraph still holds good. Would you ever construct an ugly looking building and present it? And attitudes don't care where you shape them. Don't think that in everything that I do internally, I can have compromising attitude. In the infrastructure I create alone, excellence will come. No, it doesn't come. Attitudes don't care where you shape them. People who come to work regularly late, not occasionally, they think it's a matter of principle. Daily they should come little late. Think about it. They can never fulfill deadlines. If they say Monday it will be given, they are basically telling you, Monday I will tell you when I will give. If they tell you 30 days it will be done, you can be sure about it on the 30th day when you follow up, he is going to ask for an extension. You give them a target to achieve that this year you have to do 100 crores, in that department alone permanently it's 88 crores, 91 crores, but never 100 crores. Attitudes don't care where you shape them. Once shaped, it will become part of your behavior. Again, everywhere I have to quote research because I want you to know there is validity to what I am speaking. Either the validity is my own life's experience or enormous amount of research has been done. Of all the players who played the game of cricket, Kapil Dev and Imran Khan have bowled the least number of no balls for the amount of cricket they have played. And research reveals these are the only two bowlers who never bowl a no ball in net practice. Now, your system does not know which is net practice and which is actual match. So when you are casual about the crease in net practice, you end up being casual about it even in the actual match. And that is why you will find that all technically sound cricketers, let us say Rahul Dravid while he is batting, 
without moving his feet he misses a ball you will immediately see rahul dravid do something he will shadow practice the shot properly why he is doing it is attitudes don't care where you shape them once shaped it will become your behavior i'll i can give you enough examples some we can implement some you will not implement but i'll give you examples those who conquer the gap between waking up and getting up every morning you no know, every morning we set up a wake up call and that poor thing rings because you set it up <laughs> and then we have one snooze button which we press so that 10 more minutes we can sleep which means i give myself a promise i'll get up at 6 o'clock i set up a wake up call and that poor thing wakes me up because i asked it to wake up and i don't respect my own decision i want to sleep for some more time which means the body prevails over the mind the mind decided to get up at 6 o'clock the body refused and all of you sitting here where there is a gap between your waking up and getting up always and you need a few snooze buttons before you get up look into your life your will power must be the lowest you must have at least 10 times told i won't smoke again at least about 15 times you should have joined in a gym with annual membership that's how they make money they give you annual membership knowing very well you will not come beyond two months in fact if everybody who takes an annual membership to a gym goes for the entire year gyms have to close down their entire profit comes out of your low commitment levels with all the resolutions you have taken to exercise reebok has grown rich adidas has grown rich nike has grown rich fitness one has grown rich and the only thing about you that has grown is madhya pradesh <laughs> and the reason is watch in the morning there is a gap between waking up and getting up your grandmother your wife your mother do not have will power problems because they don't have a gap between waking up and getting up attitudes don't care where you shape them one shape they will become a part of you wherever you go lot of arguments about is it practical to be honest or it's okay to lie now, i don't want to go to the philosophical side but let's just understand attitudes don't care where you shape them the only reason you lie in life is you don't have the courage to face the situation the only reason you lie is you don't want to face the situation lying helps you to escape the situation and once you get habituated to lying and escaping the situation any situation which is tough for you to face you resort to immediately lying to escape the situation it's not about lying or it's not about honesty you tell me to hit the top should you face situations or should you run away from situations now people who are liars always run away from a situation and hence they never hit the top i don't have to know your chairman i don't have to know the top guys in the organization without seeing them i'll tell you they have reached where they have reached because they must be practicing unquestionable honesty and integrity in whatever they do and this allows them to face any situation and the courage to face any situation actually takes you to the top but where is this problem created in uttering small lies in areas where lie need not be uttered at all i'm not speaking about honesty i'm just explaining to you attitude do not care where you shape them one shape they become a part of you in fact when i'm trying to open a bottle and the cork is tight and somebody puts their hand to be saying that i can open it and i give it to them they try to open it and they are not able to open it let's say it's my own son and he says appa i'm not able to open it i tell him don't give up either open the bottle or break the bottle but don't give it back saying that i cannot do it's a very small situation but this attitude to give up that you will pick up with a bottle will become your attitude everywhere today in corporate also any responsibility given you will try for 3 months and then come back and saying i am not able to do it you can probably hand it over to him you transfer me to the other department and every give up person sitting here develop this attitude not here in seemingly ordinary things in life from which that attitude is developed attitude do not care where you shape them once sh shaped they become your behavior your system does not know net practice for it everything is actual cricket actual match and hence when we talk about 
the first quality that was there in all of them was passion for excellence now this has to be cultivated not in the big things in every way the way you gift wrapped a gift there has to be passion in the your shoes have to be polished unless you're sporting a beard it has to be a shaven face it has to be trimmed it has to be trimmed the pen that you have in your pocket has to be the right pen kerchiefs have to be folded you can't roll it and it appears that there is a third one there it has to be folded it has to be kept the way it has to be kept the rupee notes have to be clean if you wear a tie it has to exactly end where the belt is the shirts have to be ironed the crease in the pant has to be perfect unless it is going to be flat the socks should not have a hole though it is hiding inside the shoes unless you develop an attitude for excellence on all the small things there will not be excellence on the big things in life because attitudes do not care where you shape them everywhere when you get up from the chair from your cubicle and leave turn the chair the way it should be let it not be half turned no turn it i know these are small things clean the table at the end of the day when you leave walk in back to a clean table before you begin the day small things but makes a difference put the things into the drawer they have to get into but it makes a difference your car has to be clean from inside also we should not open the door and feel enga vandu da it has to be clean even from inside it matters and these are not small things when you write a mail and there is a key statement make it bold make it underline use a highlighter somewhere bring in the touch of excellence seeing it people should know i can see a signature in this i can see his touch of class in this infinite thoughts they all refer to i'm not boasting but to me it matters so i'm saying do you know every single page of the lakhs of copies that get circulated undergoes quality control you cannot find in a single copy of the entire magazine a mistake or flaw everything is checked december comes and calendars and table tops are distributed and we are talking in terms of distributing a few lakhs of calendars and table tops into 12 sheets everything is quality checked and it is about an attitude it is about saying that let me factor a few more thousand rupees of human resources to check this but nothing defective should leave from this place to do with this passion for excellence nobody makes it alone we are not one man army we are all organizations so you alone producing that excellence without the team without the colleagues without everybody else understanding the value of excellence nothing is going to happen so your excellence has to get translated into the team and the second quality that was common in all of them is they were extraordinary in developing a team extraordinary in relating with people in fact people love to be part of them whether it was the 12 apostles of jesus christ or the second line of leadership from nehru to azad to naidu that mahatma gandhi was able to build it was the front line soldiers who represented martin luther king it really didn't matter in which direction it was done from religion to social revolution to a piece of art If Rafael Nadal plays the game that he plays, it's a combination of his physiotherapist, his masher, his coach. It's a team that works together. His managers, everybody works together cre to create a Rafael Nadal team. I know by now everybody uses it. We gave it to the world the first T E A M. Together, everybody achieves more. That's what team is. T E A M together everybody achieves more Leander Pierce and Mahesh Bhupathi were on the same side of the net they were the top seeds in the world 
There wasn't anybody that they could not defeat. Every Grand Slam came in search of them. They got ego involved with each other. They went against each other. Now everybody defeats both of them. Which means what's the team? Somehow you and me understanding we are on the same side of the net. If today I stand here, full of ego, feeling I'm holier than you, my speech will stink. You will tolerate me till 6 o'clock out of respect for people who brought me and later tell them, next time you bring somebody like this, it will stink. And if you sitting there is ego involved with me, you are hearing to some noise, you are not listening to any speech. Ego doesn't help any one of us. We get ego involved with our parents. Family is a team. We get ego involved with our parents. We get ego involved with our spouse. Vice president from here will go home. She cares a damn your vice president. She wants husband home. You can explain to your son why you don't attend the school day functions because you are head projects here. The son wants a father. He doesn't want head projects at home. He just wants a father who can come and sit there and simply listen to his performance, clap hands and go. Rather than telling him you need to improve. He wants a father there. Your parents want a son, a daughter to come home. They don't want to see a financial controller coming home and giving a lecture on economy of the country. A family is a team. An organization is a team. And today we shift projects, we shift departments. Sometimes you become the boss of your boss. And all these changes are going to happen. In fact, again I have to bring a research. 50 years of data of all resignations of the Fortune 500 companies was research. And they realized 98% of people who resigned revealed people do not quit an organization. People quit people. I'm not happy with my boss. He didn't treat me properly. I was not given the promotion I want. I was not given the increment. He was given undue increment. This is a big problem. I was not given also okay. He was given okay. People quit people. All the issues of relationship. Why your best friend suddenly is not your best friend? A seemingly ordinary incident through the spectacles of ego looks magnified. In fact, if you have heard about this incident from two other people, you will think this incident is nothing. Phew. And yet the incident looks exaggeratedly big when you are involved because ego is involved. Probably one of you sitting here have not seen your sister for three years because she felt you didn't treat her properly in last Diwali when she came. And a precious relationship is gone. Anil Ambani is not happy with 40,000 crores. If 40,000 crores is not enough for you, my son, how much ever we give will not be enough for you. You think for 40,000 crores he split himself from Mukesh? Ego. And life has taught me experientially. In fact, if I had known they are going to introduce me, I would have told them not to introduce. Nobody listens to an introduction. And this is a very funny thing you do. You write an introduction about yourself and ask them to read. Now the one who read does not know me. Okay. He doesn't know anything about me. Whatever was written and given. And this is a very funny thing. Unless you are ego involved, you will not write an introduction about your own greatness and give and they have to read and you sit and listen to how great you are and you turn around to see and in case while reading the introduction he missed an important paragraph I would have felt so bad one important thing about me he forgot to tell people <laughs> if my one and a half hours of speech to you does not introduce me to you a separately read introduction will not introduce me to you it does not introduce me to you. But ego, I have gone through this. Initially when I had started, my ego will say, 
this building only they did not allow me inside as a salesman no now same building then your walk itself becomes very artificial because your chief guest i have suffered all this for 2 years wherever i go i'll see whether they recognize me or not in fact whether my chair looks special or it looks ordinary big chair the chair one chair is there which you can hire small person sitting in a big chair then you feel you are the main person i have gone through all this for 2 years going on sitting in the car till somebody comes and opens the door after that you have to only lift crane will not come that means you can open the door and come out chief guest till door opens you should not come out and going back to the car the heart keeps on beating that shall they give are they giving or they keeping it because <laughs> sometimes very expensive momentos come this i know for my dot rate to become patu pavada now okay and this what to do with chal in chennai both in time comedy ma but i think i had to lose a few relationship beautiful relationship he was wonderful i was wonderful we shared a great relationship seemingly ordinary incidents through the spectacles of ego looks absolutely wrong ego magnifies everything experientially today i know when ego comes everything else goes see now what your ego has done to you it has given you sleepless nights it has not made you peaceful with the very boss who groomed you to what you are today because of him only you became what you became now you get ego involved with him and you can no more see him the way you can see him gratitude becomes ingratitude because of ego in fact some of you sitting here would have lost your most precious employee in a small incident you as a leader got ego involved with him and some of till the end reasoning never made you understand it was not actually his mistake your ego wanted to hamper on it was his mistake you lost him and when a trained skilled resource from an organization is lost it not only weakens the existing organization it strengthens the competition because you have handed over a trained resource to him and for what i can understand unethical practice he did something which was immoral misappropriation only thing was the boss became ego involved with the team member or vice versa in fact it's such a nuisance between two departments which has to synergize and collaborate for the welfare of the organization but this general manager is ego involved with this general manager in fact the enemy is not outside there is no competition outside enemy is within the organization half the time goes off in doing panchayat between these two people see he is like that you don't take it like this end of the day you have to go back home and do the same thing tell your mother my wife is young you have to adjust <laughs> then go inside the bedroom and tell her amma from the beginning is like that only we all adjust you adjust Oh, life goes off in ego management. I didn't realize in the first two years I've been on that side. I thought ego was my strength. I was ego was my shield. I used to walk six inches taller than I'm supposed to be. Today I don't even wear chapels on any stage that I stand on, out of respect for the work that I do. Because the story came from nowhere and changed my life forever. it seems a crow was flying holding on to a piece of meat between its beak and it saw a lot of other birds were chasing it the further and further it tried to fly it saw more and more birds were chasing it that's when it seems it occurred to the crow they are all not chasing me they are chasing that piece of meat i'm holding between my beak it seems it split the beak and dropped that piece of meat all the birds went after that falling piece of meat alone in the sky it seems the crow remarked in losing that piece of meat the entire sky became mine and i'm telling you that has been my greatest transformation i'm glad it came so early to me in life i realized when ego comes everything else goes when ego goes everything else comes 
there's great freedom so you can be yourself this is me doesn't matter whether you catch me in a bazaar you catch me in a program you see me in the house you see me in the airport this is me the freedom that you have you don't have to falsify you don't have to project you no more live your life through the other people's eyes i am what i am independent of 500 of you sitting here 500 opinions are made about me which i cannot control there's only one thing i can control who i am you make 500 opinions and that's up to you i cannot do anything about it. the moment i become ego involved i become reputation oriented then my thought is what should i speak which will impress you today i'm not speaking to impress i'm speaking to express out of my experience i'm saying what have i seen in life and what will work and it's 90 minutes of expression for me and i will leave and there is this great freedom no matter what i do hundreds of thousands of lives are today touched through this path every sunday morning a satsang is watched in 110 countries doesn't matter when i go home i am a son to my parents i am a husband to my wife i am a father to my children and that's all i am nothing else my father with a lot of freedom can still scold me are we land and that morning i would have spoken in the satsang about the power of intelligence adha pathi enga appa kaavala kedaya he will only ask akal nahi hai but my father is my father just because i do something in life it doesn't change anything and this this great freedom and the moment you understand when ego goes everything else comes the bonding power with people becomes so natural relating with people becomes much much easier in fact for a person who is not ego involved to deal with an egoistic person is just like that it's only when you are ego involved he is ego involved two angry monkeys at each other lot of noise will come when you are not ego involved the other is ego involved neutralizing the ego of the other person sometimes by not feeding it sometimes by feeding it becomes so easy eventually the purpose is achieved together everybody achieves more all of them had this immaculate ability to transcend their personal ego whether it's in their personal life or in their official life and they were able to build a team which had passion for excellence the way you can unite with a passion for excellence a team and in corporate parlance i'm sure all of you are aware of your success with the team depends on how much time you invest with them of the job think about people who are closest to you in lnt they are not the ones with whom you relate only on the job those are the people with whom you relate even off the job probably you have dinner together maybe your family has gone to their house maybe you went on a team building picnic outside the organizational premises and came back probably you understood he was disturbed today end of the day you took him to the coffee shop sat and heard how disturbed he is that he is not able to get to sister mary i don't know what it was your success on the job depends on the time you invest with your people of the job listen to the word i used both the times not the time you spend i really think the time you give to your people of the job is an investment and it's not an expenditure it comes back multifold in terms of the loyalty your team displays to the cause and the purpose of the team your success on the job depends on the time you invest with your people of the job maybe institutionalize it it's worth institutionalizing probably the fifth saturday of every quarter which automatically comes every quarter the second half will be the team just getting to know each other playing some knowing games getting involved with some activities maybe a nature walk within this premises but somehow by incorporating certain structures and procedures where you can bond together off the job is going to bring out tremendous results on the job passion for excellence together everybody achieves more their ability to build a team how do you build a team with what quality do you build a team three all of them had mastery in communication mastery in communication 
In spite of the fact Zen is a very profound philosophy, Zen is not a growing religion because Gren Zen depends on mysticism. In mysticism, they don't communicate much. Whether it is the Bhagavad Gita unfolded through Krishna, the Bible, the compilation of the wisdom of Jesus Christ, or the Quran that was unfolded as the call of Allah, or the Dhammapada, the compilation of Buddha, or the Dharma of Jainism, everything is an expression of the communication of the spiritual masters. It is not that Mahatma Gandhi was the only one who sought freedom for India, but he was a master communicator who could empower the masses with his ideas. Why Manmohan Singh by himself cannot win an election? He can't communicate. It seems his dentist told him, please open the mouth, otherwise I can't check. <laughs> for nothing he'll speak. So why Sonia Gandhi is required? Why still Karunanadi has to be the bonding factor for the entire party? Communication. Why Jayanti Natarajan? Why Sushma Choraj? Why Arun Jaitley? Why they have to be the spokesman for political parties? A communicator is required to express themselves. Why Sachin Tendulkar with all the mastery in the game was a failure as a captain? He cannot communicate. What is Dhoni's strength? What is Gambi's strength? Capable communicators. In spite of the fact he was not a great cricketer, why Mike Brerley was able to produce the sort of results he produced? Master communicator. Why Picasso and Leonardo da Vinci? They could express themselves. Communication is everything. We have left it to chance. We were willing to undergo education to develop our engineering abilities. We were willing to pursue a chartered accountancy to develop our financial intelligence. We were de willing to undergo anything to develop ourselves. Communication alone, most of us have left it to chance. Because we could talk, we assumed we can also communicate. In talking, not necessarily you empower others. In communication, you have the ability to empower others. Scribbling, when properly trained, becomes handwriting. Shouting, when it's properly trained, becomes singing. Running, when it's properly trained, becomes athleticism. Ability, when trained, becomes proficiency. Talking, when it's trained, becomes communication. You have to invest a conscious awareness of developing yourself into a master communicator. Master communication basically means my ideas and feelings towards what I want to communicate, I should succeed in transferring to others and they should be able to understand the same ideas and the same feelings. See if I can transfer ideas to you, but I cannot transfer the feeling I have for the ideas, then this entire communication will be a failure. Whether this 90 minutes will just be an information exchange or a potential transformation depends on whether I succeeded in only talking to you ideas or could I also express my emotions to you. Mastery in communication. And such simple thing on mastery in communication. And it can do so much. In fact, one of those organizations which was founded and developed another infrastructure company Nowhere to the magnitude of this, but a fast-growing infrastructure company. And they had a tremendous amount of interdepartmental rivalry. So they had asked me if I can just come and get some cooperation focus within the organization. And we had a very small program for them. I won't even call it a program. I went there as a well-wisher. So just divided the organization into multiple heterogeneous groups. So it's not that all vice presidents were in one group. There was a vice president, there was a manager, there was an office boy, there was a clerical staff. And like that the teams were divided. And I drew a lot of circles. Every team was given a balloon. And every team was told that the game is, you cannot leave the circle. And whichever team can keep tapping and hold the balloon at the top the longest will be declared winners. There is a child inside each one of us, so everybody got excited. It was not a tough game to play. And they kept tapping, and as you would expect, one team won. 
I just asked all of them to sit down wherever they are so that that heterogeneity was maintained and when they all of them sat down, I just looked at all of them and said, when you were tapping the balloon, what was the only thought that was there in your mind? All of them said to keep the balloon at the top. I said, did it really matter to you whether you did more work or he did more work? Did any one of you ever say, why I am going on tapping, why he is watching? Because if you think like that, balloon will fall. <laughs> Did it matter to you, I am vice president, how I alone will do all the work, I will delegate it to the office boy, tomorrow be. <laughs> Did it matter? In fact, one of your office boys accidentally stamped you on the feet. Okay, not accidentally, intentionally stamped you on the feet. This was his chance. Did it even give you the time to complain about what he did? Why? During the entire game, there was only one thing in your mind. Focus. To keep the balloon at the top. I immediately turned towards the managing director and told him that balloon at the top is an organizational goal, an organizational objective. And if everybody in the organization are empowered to believe they play a significant role, in keeping the balloon at the top, nobody will have time to complain. Nobody will have time to get distracted. The question I have to ask you right now is, do you have a balloon? Is there an organizational vision? And in case it is there, a very important question to ask, has this goal been communicated to the last person in the organization? I realize they have a goal, but the managing director was not a communicator. He doesn't know how to communicate the vision of the organization to the rest of the team. So each one was pursuing their own interest rather than working as a collective team towards keeping the balloon at the top. Mastery in communication. Husband and wife relationship is about communication. Most of the time relationships get spoiled, not because there are problems with intentions, but we don't know how to communicate. Think about any husband and wife fight. Do you ever fight first three minutes only in a husband and wife fight? You're fighting about what you're fighting. From the fourth minute, you're fighting about the way you're fighting. From the fourth minute, it's always, why did you ask me like that? What was asked is forgotten. Okay. But if you can talk to me like that, you think I cannot talk to you like that? And we are no more fighting about the issue. From the fourth minute in any relationship, watch. The focus is no more who is right. The focus is no more what is right. The focus is who is right. I am right or you are right. Communication. Parenting is communication. The challenge of parenting adolescent children is how you communicate with them. If you don't know how to communicate with them, by the second sentence they will tell you, Papa, I am going to tell you. And we are not leaving talking as an assumption that it is communication. You have to invest some focus and attention in developing your communicative abilities. Four, all of them had high energy levels. There are no off days in the life of a legend. Think about anybody whom you admire for where they have reached in life and you cannot associate tiredness to them. In fact, they always surprise you with their energy levels. How nothing tires them. You, in fact, end of the day you can go and see them and they are still exhibiting the same amount of energy you saw them right in the morning. From where does this energy come from these people? They all operate out of high energy levels. Some of what I say you will not like. But let me say. One, if you have to have high energy levels, you have to wake up around sunrise. Local sunrise. <laughs> the energy that is available for you to inherit during dawn and dusk are the highest. That is why in all the religion, some religious practice was always given to you to practice around sunrise and sunset. The energy for you to inherit is the highest. What happens for most of us in modern corporate life is, sunset is always lost inside organizational premises. We are not in touch with it at all. 
we live out of artificial lights we don't even know what time of the day it is outside so the only opportunity any one of you as a professional have to inherit the energy of nature is to ensure you participate in the time where darkness gives into light the dawn so you will find that anybody who is waking up around sunrise their energy levels in fact you can find out just identify a few people amongst your colleagues who is the most energetic person and ask them when do they work up almost all of them will say i rise before sunrise all of them initially it will be difficult because the body has to set itself into a new biorhythm those of you are used to waking up at 7 o'clock and suddenly now you decide you are going to wake up at 5:30 5:45 when you decide to wake up at that time initially you will feel sleepy that is just because the body is not setting itself into a new biological rhythm that's all 21 days if you can wake up at the rescheduled time your body will reset itself it reset itself into the new routine just to give you an example this is not about waking up early. those of you are waking up at 7 o'clock every day decide to wake up at 6 o'clock and you will say we go to work and we feel sleepy there 21 days you will go through this the body has to reset its biorhythm but this is also true if you sleep more those of you who normally wake up at 7 o'clock sunday because you want to relax you get up at 11 o'clock now when you get up at 11 o'clock your theory if you sleep more you should feel brisk you should feel brisk when you get up at 11 o'clock on sunday how do you feel bulky there is no such english word for it but the exact word for how you feel when you wake up at 11 o'clock is you feel buffaloish thookinde nadaka mudiyadu because the body cannot handle any shift in biorhythm this side or that side so you'll find that once you create the shift where your wake up is around sunrise for 21 days the body will go through a lot of natak lot of natak will be there you'll feel sleepy during working hours to put it superficially morning it won't come when you want it to come because the, the body has to go through all these adjustments you will come to the breakfast table and you will not feel like eating or you will feel hungry later but it will reset itself two you have to live on energizing food what do we mean by energizing food the more the food goes through transition from sunlight the less energizing it becomes listen energizing food is where the energy supplied by the food is greater than the energy consumed to digest the food energy draining food is the energy consumed to digest the food is greater than the energy supplied by the food so those of you where after you eat you feel immediately a little sleepy the food is not an energizing food it is an energy sapping food because the only source of physical energy for us is from the sun through the process of photosynthesis the chlorophyll is nothing but the extract of that solar energy so the more and more you deviate whether it is eating the flesh that lives out of this or exaggerated cooking processes which it goes through nobody is telling you immediately become one saint and eat only become a grasshopper eating only green if you can ensure that greenery half cooked raw food fruits salads sprouts vegetables even if it is one of the important meal for your day just ensure there is enough energizing food that is going into you i'll put it this way if a portion of what you eat is tongue conscious food let a portion of what you eat be health conscious food if the balance can be achieved and if you are able to wake up around sunrise you are going to see a tremendous shift in your energy levels and your passion for excellence will give you a lot more energy one passion for excellence two the ability to develop a team three mastery in communication four high energy levels five value based decision making hallmark of leadership is consistency in decision making i think you are a very weak leader if outside your cabin people are discussing today he is not in right mood don't ask 
So basically what they are saying is, you can be caught in an emotionally weak moment and you will give it. Which means your decision is mood based decision making. When you are, so to same proposal from this employee you will say yes. Same proposal to that employee because that fellow doesn't know how to speak. You will say no, it is not approved. There is no fairness, there is no consistency in decision making. One hallmark of leadership is fairness and consistency in leadership. I don't have time to talk about me or the path, but there is this great pride that I've enjoyed for 17 years. No matter where in the globe the program has been done, no matter who the target audience was, nobody has ever entered a program of mine late and they have not been allowed inside in 17 years. Anywhere and in all the 17 years, all the programs anywhere in the world of mine has started exactly on time. No factors. In fact, no factors. Ministers as chief guest has been kept outside the door. Commissioner of police city, when Alexander was the commissioner of police, and I had a pro program for all the IPS officers there, everybody were there. He was on chief minister's duty, and that's why he could not come. He came in late, and I told him, I'm sorry, I do not allow latecomers inside my program. In fact, a lot of people can see a lot of things about me. But one area I cannot be questioned. Punctuality has been a value-based decision making. No individual has been treated differently. And like this, there's, a lot, there's consistency. See, when no salary advance, no salary advance. Yes, salary advance, yes, salary advance. No, do not take these two days off at this time. This is true for everybody. If your decision making is not value-based, they will manipulate you. They'll completely manipulate you. Guys who can talk to you, guys who can study your emotions, guys who can kindle emotions in you, will always get things out of you and later you'll feel guilty. I think I gave in. When your decisions are not value based, it'll always happen. There is one soft employee in the department who will always get fired. He's a social worker. Whenever you want to fire, he'll come. Sir, cutting la? In fact, namage paavamar go. Enna vandu vandu vain porane. In fact, and there are people who will never get fired. In fact, whenever you want to fire, he is not around. How you don't know he is not around? Or he will come to. Now, the moment he comes, ask him to come. I want to talk to him. And he'll come in such a way that guests are sitting there in front of whom you can't fire. Le poyi daprava. Aadu kulla kono dalijir. But somehow there are people who can just manipulate you. And you will yield to a few if your decision making is not value based. One of the names of leadership is fairness, consistency in decision making. Also, those of you where your decision making is value based, you don't expend a lot of emotional energy so you don't become tired. If your decision making is not value based, then every now and then you will have to take a decision, you have to regret the decision, you have to analyze the decision, you have to amend the decision and a tremendous amount of emotional energy is expended. So develop a set of certain guiding principles. A country without a constitution, an organization without policies, a man without principles is nothing in life. If you cannot stand for something, you will fall for everything. Bring in that value based decision making and there will be consistency in your leadership. One thing that was common in all of them, methodology, the sixth. They had their own ways to achieve the objectives they have set for themselves. What's your methodology? A very important question to ask. It's nice to have goals, it's nice to have ambitions, it's nice to have that big thinking that you're going to do this, you're going to do that. How? What's your methodology? A dying cricket was revived with a methodology called T20. It's a methodology. Same game, but some innovation, some creativity was brought in. Going to cinema theaters was dying. Multiplex is an innovation, a methodology. In fact, people were not enjoying this entire experience of buying from provision stores. Supermarkets came so that you can feel the product. And as a result, think about it today. You go to buy a shampoo and you come with a packet full of other things which you have bought other than the shampoo. 
Why? Because the supermarket gives you the feel of certain products and that increases your desire. And with plastic being swiped, in fact, it's not possible for you to go to buy one and buy only that one and come back. You invariably end up buying a lot more. Methodology, deliveries. Today, how pharmacies, how Apollo Pharmacy was able to turn pharmacy business into such a such methodology, door deliveries. Think about it. It's all about methodology. Ordinary things have become significant things by methodology. In India, it's called Uttapu. All over the world, it's called Pisa. Methodology. Somebody was able to take it and brand it and give a structure to it. Why McDonald's is able to do what it's able to do? Proven management practices will tell you. A professional organization is one where even ordinarily skilled people can produce extraordinary results through the power of systems. I repeat, a professional organization is one where even ordinarily skilled people can produce extraordinary results by the power of systems. What is McDonald's? Now, it is a system by which how that burger is done. This is the size of the bun. This is the machine that will create it. After that, this is where you have to keep the ham. This is where you have to keep the cabbage. And this is comes in. Then this is the sauce that has to be done. Anybody can be trained because making a burger is done through a system. Why Sarana Bhavan was able to create a chain of stores? Sambar making was a system. Coffee making was a system. Why some of the best hotels could not replicate themselves? In fact, anybody in the world who has created maximum wealth creation have created maximum wealth creation because they created a business model that can be duplicated, that can be replicated. And unless you create a methodology that can be replicated, and McDonald's is a classic example, Pizza Corner is a classic example, Pizza Hut is a classic example, Frankie is a classic example. Because once you systematize, any bugger can make a burger. Otherwise, you need Arusu and Nataraj. Otherwise, you cannot make. It has. So, what is your methodology? LNT has a methodology. LNT has an engineering. I'm asking you. You can be the youngest director in this company. You can probably be the one who grew the fastest to the top of this organization. You can become a brand in your own right within LNT. What is going to be your methodology to hit the top? What are you going to innovate? What are you going to revolutionize? What creativity? What is going to be the ways by which you are going to be a path breaker and thereby you will be a path finder? What will be your methodology? A constant lingering question has to keep Satyagraha was his methodology. Taking the surplus from the rich and giving it to the poor. By just being a bridge, that was Mother Teresa's methodology. Design engineering, Steve Jobs' methodology. Becoming the intelligence behind the technology, Bill Gates' methodology. Style, Rajnikanth's methodology. Exploration, Kamal Hassan's methodology. Dance, Hrithik Roshan's methodology. Entertainment into a sport which is otherwise boringly slow. Lalit Modi's methodology. What is your methodology? Don't make anybody think they are capable of anything. Then you will remain the chief minister. Jailatha's methodology. Everybody has a methodology. What is your methodology? Keep thinking, keep innovating, keep discovering. And the seventh factor, all of them had faith. All of them had faith. Now it doesn't matter whether they had faith in God, faith in systems, faith in principles, faith in values, faith in their religion, faith in meditation, faith in Dhirubhai Ambani. Till the end was asked, what is the secret of your success? And his reply will always begin, I have my mother's blessings with me. Everybody used to think that he will say about engineering, reverse engineering, and his answer always began saying that I have my mother's blessing and that was his faith. Because I have my mother's blessings, my dreams will turn into reality. What is your faith? Because people that we are, 
in our striving to produce results sometimes when things go wrong our confidence will be ruffled it is only when you have an anchor of faith you can restore that confidence back in you the faith itself can be elated because i know i am part of it everything will go right for me i don't know what your faith is but all of them had an anchor to faith one passion for excellence two the ability to develop a team three mastery in communication four high energy levels five value based decision making six methodology and seven an anchor of faith built on the three personal principles that has learnt very early for me in life subordinate your likes and dislikes to the purpose of your life do you want to be a typical 19 year old or a 19 year old the other 19 year olds will look up to there is a way and the way is on the way let problems come from anywhere solutions will come from me has groom to build from this very place whether the magazine infinity thoughts or the organization infinityism which is truly growing global today i don't think i came here to just impress you with the talk of mine but to impress upon you standing in front of you is a person who has come up in life purely on the strength of his work and how he kept discovering himself through work the magical moment to my life came when i had read in the rigveda a moment of predicament for a devotee it seems it's there in the rigveda it seems the devotee tells his god i have received so much from you god i have nothing to give you in return but i want to give you something in return so i thought i'll offer this flowers to you but my god these flowers are already yours how can i take what is yours and give it to you whose flowers am i offering to whom I thought I'll offer these fruits to you, but these fruits are already yours. How can I to take your fruit and offer it to you? So, my Lord, I thought I will pray to you in words, but my Lord, the air I will articulate with my tongue is already yours. Why have you put me in such a helpless situation, my God? You have given me so much. I want to give you something in return, but anything I think of to give you in return is already yours. I have nothing to give you. so let me drop this body of mine at your feet and the devotee drops his body at the feet of his lord and prostrates some of when i read that it was a very touching experience for me a few weeks later when i was sitting there in one of the temples in silence suddenly this insight occurred to me and i whispered in prayer to my lord and i said it's true lord everything that you have given me is yours nothing is mine including me because i am also your creation but taking all these raw materials together and putting it together through work that is my creation work is my creation it is only through my work i am bringing this body this intelligence this mental abilities my emotions and the other human resources you have given me everything together to create whatever create so the all the raw materials are yours the finished product that i create through work that work is mine some of in an instant that day in that temple i whispered to my lord and i said if work is basically my creation from this instant all the work i do will be my offering unto you my lord i may not pray to you in words i may not pray to you in words i may not pray to you through slogans i may not pray to you through offering but i'll pray to you on a daily basis i will work every day to the highest standards that are possible because when it is you god i do not want to give you anything but the best and if i do not want to give you anything but the best then let me ensure the work i do is the very best doesn't matter whether it was 500 of you or only 4 of you i had still delivered the speech with the same intensity because my speech is incidentally for lntites and lnt but heart of heart the speech of mine is at another offering of mine to my god i am working as an offering unto him and i told my god if all the work i do 
is my offering unto you then the very life i live will become my prayer unto you my life will be my prayer to you and ever since i have been just living my life treating my work as my offering unto him and hence one day i took this decision if friday is the holy day of islam if sunday is the holy day of christianity if thursday will be the holy day for people who follow sai baba raghavendra if india has to be a top of the world nation then economic growth is required and if economic growth is required how beautiful will it be if the entire 1.2 billion population of this country independent of their religion start treating monday as their holy day and start looking forward to work if we can drive away the monday morning blues if monday is more exciting to us than friday is any of one seventh of your life is going to be monday might as well look forward to it maximum number of heart attacks happen between 9 and 9:30 on a monday morning it shocks me if people thinking about going to work get heart attack how will we build a new economic world so i'm not imposing anything on you but i personally told myself from that day monday will be my holy day i look forward to work i'll cherish the mondays of my life i will produce work of the highest standards and doesn't matter what comes in return of all that work i do all my work will be my offering unto you my lord and thus my very life will be my prayer unto you it's such a privilege to come and stand in front of people who may truly respect for the way you strive to make it in life inside a building that i've always admired from outside and addressing an organization in its own right i really believe is a pride of india let a magnificent future unfold for each one of you in your own ways wishing you most and more I love you so much thank you